first thing I'd like to say about Mars is how big it isn't. Of course, like all planets, compared to the size of our solar system, it's less than a tiny speck. But look here how it compares to the size of our home planet Earth. The force of gravity on Mars is significantly less. If you weighed 150 pounds on Earth, you'd weigh only 56 pounds on Mars. You know how air has mass and therefore has weight? Well, just as you weigh less on Mars, so does air. But that's the thing. It weighs so little that most of it has long ago jumped off into space. The gravity from this planet isn't strong enough to hold down an atmosphere much more than 40% of what we have here on Earth. Another thing about Mars's small size is that this allowed the inner core to cool down relatively quickly. Which stays warm longer after coming out of the oven? The center of a large loaf of bread or the center of a cookie? The cookie is smaller with more surface area to volume, so it cools down quicker. Likewise, the insides of Mars likely cooled down within only a few billion years after its formation. Once this happened, movement within the mantle would have come to a grinding halt. The result? No magnetosphere to protect the atmosphere from cosmic radiation. No plate tectonics to allow for recycling of materials such as the carbon cycle. That's right, a planet that, geologically speaking, is close to dead. So, what do we have today? Well, the thin atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide and about 3% nitrogen, and not much oxygen. Why? Because, remember your chemistry, oxygen is a rather reactive molecule. It reacts to form oxide compounds, such as rust. In fact, it's all that rust on the surface of Mars that gives this planet its characteristic red color. Well, a burnt orange, if you'd ask me. But through the ages, as seen from Earth with the naked eye, it's surely a reddish twinkle. Hmm. What does Earth look like from Mars? A bluish twinkle? Sorry, this is a black and white image. But check this out. That's Earth from the Martian surface. Most all of human history occurred right there. I say most because I think space probes, lunar and planetary landings, they count as rather historical events, don't you? Because oxygen is so reactive, you can only get a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet if the oxygen is somehow being produced faster than it's consumed. On Earth, our abundant oxygen comes from photosynthesis, both on the land and in the oceans. Not much oxygen in the Martian atmosphere suggests no life forms. But life can be creative. Another reactive gaseous molecule, methane, is also produced by life forms. And yes, methane has been detected on Mars. Not that much. But enough to warrant further exploration. This methane could well come from non-living sources. But then again... There may be Martian microbes living deep beneath the surface. Why down there? One, it has to escape the intense solar radiation. Two, it's warmer. And three, there's water down there too. Apparently, a lot. Yep, there's certainly water on Mars. Remember, Mars orbits just within that habitable zone. Space probes tell us the soil is about 2% water, even around the equator. Frozen at the surface, sure, but for future explorers, this is important. Just warm up a cup of dirt or soil and drain out the liquid water you need for drinking or for electrolyzing to create breathable oxygen. It's projected that Mars once had much more water than it does today perhaps even sporting oceans in its distant past. But Mars keeps losing this water to space. So the current supply is dwindling, but there's still plenty of water left, most of it likely underground. On the surface, most of the water is found at the poles. How much? Close to the size of Greenland's ice sheet, 
over a million cubic kilometers. If it all melted, you'd get an ocean averaging about 11 meters deep. Interesting, huh? A Martian solar day is about 24 and a half hours, much like Earth. But being farther from the sun and with little atmosphere for a warming effect, it's quite cold. On a hot day at the equator, it can get over 20 degrees Celsius. It's about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But temperatures well below freezing are the norm, down to minus 150 degrees Celsius at the poles. Mars rotates at an angle of about 25 degrees, which is just a little more than Earth's 23-degree axial tilt. So Mars, like Earth, has seasons. During the summer months, the water of the caps sublimes, which means it goes directly from a solid to a gas. High in the atmosphere, the water vapor refreezes to form clouds of ice crystals. Look here. The white patches are clouds of crystalline water. Also, here's a home movie made by one of our robotic rovers. The atmosphere is quite thin, but nonetheless thick enough to allow for gusts of wind and even dust devils. During the winter months, it gets so cold that the polar caps, they get covered by a thick layer of frozen carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice. This happens more so at the South Pole, which is much higher in altitude. Interestingly, the dry ice is laid down in thick, transparent slabs. When spring arrives, the sun shines right through the transparent dry ice to heat the ground, which in turn heats the dry ice slabs from below. The dry ice at the bottom thus turns to a gas, but it's stuck under the transparent slab with nowhere to escape. Pressure builds up until the slab cracks open, and through these cracks... The gaseous carbon dioxide comes gushing out. What you end up with are these tall geysers. The geysers are dark because of the soil they contain. Lots of iron in that soil. Mix the red iron with the white snow and that gives you a pinkish landscape, right? Something out of Dr. Seuss? Well, don't take these colors too literally. These images have some false color because they combine infrared frequencies that help scientists discern temperature. I think it's time now to talk about the Martian dichotomy. Notice that the northern hemisphere is all smooth, while the southern hemisphere rocky. What's more, the smooth surface of the northern hemisphere is about 8,000 meters below mean altitude. Um, that's like below sea level, right? while the southern hemisphere is about 8,000 meters above. Why this odd topology? One of the leading theories is that this is a remnant of a massive collision billions of years ago. So the smoothness of the northern hemisphere, also known as the Borealis Basin, could actually be the floor of the largest known impact crater in our solar system. Plate tectonics, like here at Earth, would have covered this up. But remember, Mars lost that ability a long time ago. So what we might be looking at here is a fossil record of a planetary impact that occurred toward the beginning of our solar system. A more obvious impact crater is the Hellas Basin, down here. Atmospheric pressure on Earth is about 101 kilopascal. Got that? On Mars, at the median altitude, the pressure is only about 0.6 kilopascal. At this low, low pressure, it's not possible to have water in the liquid phase. It just isn't. But at deeper elevations of the Borealis and Hellas basins, the atmospheric pressure rises above, just above 1 kilopascal. And amazingly, this is just enough atmospheric pressure for water to exist in the liquid phase, assuming it can get warm enough to melt. So let's build some space mirrors focusing solar energy at the poles. Yeah, the dry ice would sublime, right? Lots of beautiful geysers, putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. The greenhouse effect 
would cause an increase in global temperatures, which would sublime even more CO2 into the atmosphere. Sound familiar? Here, a runaway greenhouse effect might be just what the doctor ordered. Atmospheric pressure and temperatures would rise. The ice caps would melt, and those beautiful Martian oceans would return. Possible? Sure. If there's anything we humans are good at, it's raising temperatures, yes, on a global scale. Trying to create Earth-like conditions on another planet is called terraforming. You know, if with $5 I had a choice of terraforming Mars to make it inhabitable, or terraforming Earth to keep it inhabitable, I think I'd lay my $5 down on Earth. Though... It would be nice if we could do both. Maybe one day we'll have to. We've sent a number of space probes to Mars, some now in orbit and others now roving the ground. The Viking landers of the 1970s were the first. More recent rovers include the Spirit and Opportunity, which have been touring the surface for years now. In March 2011, we landed the well-equipped Curiosity rover. More probes are on their way. From these probes, we've got some absolutely stunning views of the Martian surface. Here's one of my favorite. It's the sunset, as seen from Mars. Mars has two very small moons, Deimos and Phobos. Deimos, the smaller of the two, now disappearing behind Phobos, it moves in a geosynchronous orbit, which means it always appears in the same location in the sky. Quite tiny, actually. But watch. See how it appears to be sitting still? Yeah, that's because it's in a geosynchronous orbit. Both these moons have odd shapes, which means they might be asteroids that were caught in orbit. Here's a solar eclipse by Phobos, caught by the cameras of the Curiosity rover. The second tallest mountain in the solar system resides on Mars. This would be Olympus Mons, three times higher than Mount Everest. But keep in mind that greater heights are made possible by the weaker gravity. There are expansive canyons as well, such as Vallis Marineris, shown here. But... The nature tourist in you will have to wait. It will still be a number of years before we expend the time, energy, and money to send humans to this planet. Much more hospitable than Venus, yes, but without much of an atmosphere, ouch! Living conditions on Mars are just as deadly. At least for now. <laughs> that wraps it up for our look at the inner planets of our solar system. In the next set of lessons, we'll take a closer look at the much larger and much more distant gaseous planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Good science to you.